Здравствуйте, други, and welcome to Bishkek. I'm in the 12th micro district of this capital city here in Kyrgyzstan, and today we're doing the what's going on in Kyrgyzstan video. Thanks for stopping by. We're going to look at the history, the culture, the politics, and most importantly, why you should definitely come and visit this random and amazing Central Asian country. Let's do it. So to start this video off, I took you to a really local part of Bishkek. This is not the city center. If you're curious about kind of the really beautiful Soviet buildings of the past, you can link to my video right here. I go into detail about the Soviet time and all of that good stuff. But this is the 12th micro district. This is an expanded version of Bishkek, which continues to grow and is the largest city in the country. So this is it. We've got block housing, block housing, block housing, block housing. Since this was a Soviet city, this is kind of how they determined the city would grow. And since then, they've been putting up more housing. You can see this one certainly more modern than these ones over here. And it's interesting to be kind of in the local part to see what the local people are doing. So the first question we have to answer is, what is Kyrgyzstan and who are the Kyrgyz people? Kyrgyzstan is a country located in the Central Asian region. It's bordered by China, by Kazakhstan to the north, and to the west by the other Stan countries, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. This country has a long and very interesting history, centered specifically around the Kyrgyz people, who are a traditional Central Asian nomadic people who have lived in this region for thousands and thousands of years. So the question remains, who are the Kyrgyz people? They come from the Central Asian Turkic people, who include the Uzbeks, the Kazakhs, the Uyghurs who live in Western China, and they all speak a Turkic language, which is very similar and in the same language family as Turkish, which is the largest language in the, in the family today, as well as Azeri, those living in Azerbaijan. The Western Turkic people of Turkey and Azerbaijan are the long lost brothers of these Central Asian people who have, through conquest and migration, moved west and west and west until they took over the Anatolian Peninsula. The Kyrgyz identity today is very interesting. So as a foreigner here, coming here is very strange and challenges a lot about what you know about Asia and kind of your presuppositions about what these people will be like. So Kyrgyz people, in comparison with the Uzbeks, with the Turks, and with people more to the West, they look very East Asian. You really wouldn't be able to distinguish them from a, let's say, a Han Chinese or a typical East Asianer. What's interesting about it is you get this idea of what they're going to sound like, what they're going to be, what they are culturally, and that doesn't really match up with the reality. They speak Russian. That's really the main language of this country, especially in Bishkek, uh, with Kyrgyz being uh, kind of a secondary language that's spoken more in the regions around Kyrgyzstan. It's a kind of village language, and it's making a comeback as the, as the government is trying to push this kind of Kyrgyz national agenda. So you're sitting in a typical Kyrgyz cafe. You sit down, the, re the menu is in Russian. You see a weird melange of Russian, Kyrgyz, kind of Turkish food. Someone comes up to you, they look like they're Chinese, they start speaking to you in Russian, and if for whatever reason you don't speak Russian, you can speak to them using Turkish words if you happen to know that. It's a really weird mix, and it really challenges what you know about people and shows why you shouldn't judge a book by its cover because these people are not what your brain is telling you they are, which is super cool, which is what, what I really love about Kyrgyzstan. To get a better understanding of the modern day Kyrgyz people and what's going on here, we have to look back at the history just for a quick sec to discuss the very tumultuous land that Central Asia is. This land has had many empires, many peoples, and many warring factions trying to control this kind of central mountainous desert area that makes up today's Central Asia. The kind of first unifying force in this area were the Gokturks, which was the first large Turkic sort of empire that united a lot of warring Turkic tribes, um, you know, over a thousand years ago. Since then, many, many different empires have been through here, whether it was the Chinese, whether it was the Mongols, whether it was the different Khanates that kind of came out of the fall of the Mongol Empire, and lastly, the Russians. The fact that so many people have been through here is a reason why Kyrgyzstan and the Central Asian region today is 
extremely diverse, but most of the culture that you find here is either deriving from these ancient nomadic people, and they kind of have a revival of that today. You can see the kind of push towards more Kyrgyz education, more Kyrgyz language, and more Kyrgyz traditions. If you're interested about the Russian presence here in Kyrgyzstan, whether it was from the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, you can see my video up here. I did a whole thing about Soviet Bishkek. If you're interested, definitely check that out. Here in one of the central squares near the Philharmonic building is this guy. His name is Manas. And when you're talking about Kyrgyz history, this is kind of like their fabled folkloric hero that really defines the Kyrgyz people and has become a national icon and symbol that is still celebrated today. Kyrgyzstan recently celebrated their thousand year anniversary of the Epic of Manas or the story of Manas. This is actually one of the world's longest epic poems. It's over 500,000 lines long, if you can believe that. And every student in Kyrgyzstan technically needs to read it at least one time, which is crazy. The age of the story itself is kind of debated. A uh, thousand year anniversary means it was done in the, you know, the year 900 or the year 1000, yet the actual kind of book creation of it happened in the 1800s. So whether you believe it's a thousand years old or 200 years old, whether it's a Kyrgyz story, a Kazakh story, or just a Central Asian Turkic story, there's a lot of debate about it, but this guy, was the guy that unified the Kyrgyz people, the one that that took all these warring Turkic tribes and you know put them under one banner to fight against the uh, the Mongol invaders. The history of Kyrgyzstan is interesting because most of the traditions that were passed down through generation to generation were oral traditions because these people were inherently nomadic. So you see these statues, for example, this is Manas Chui Sagunbai. There he is, and we have some of his friends over here. Old school Kyrgyzstan, or this region, was just really run by what we call horse lords or warlords who controlled swaths of land, they fought over certain areas, but they didn't really establish large-scale settlements. A lot of the settlements that were established were done by the Uzbeks, so any kind of old buildings you find here actually weren't really built by the Kyrgyz. So we went to the Barana Tower, and uh, you'll see that coming up in the next video, but uh, that wasn't even built by the Kyrgyz people. The Kyrgyz are really truly nomadic people. They lived in yurts. Uh, they picked up and they moved with the seasons, with the availability of food, and they were not necessarily bound to any sort of area. So what's interesting is like Bishkek, the capital city here, it's not that old. It's only from the 1850s. Uh, there was a small settlement of Kyrgyz here, and then when it joined the Russian Empire, it became kind of the hub. Uh, you don't find very large cities in Kyrgyzstan. You don't find very old buildings in Kyrgyzstan. For a country with thousand, a thousand year old national epic and thousands and thousands of years of inhabited land uh, compared to China, compared to uh, India, you really don't find any historical buildings. It's a very strange thing, but I also think it's kind of cool that the Kyrgyz have stuck to that nomadic tradition, that horseback culture, and it's still really part of the culture today and it's the things that they like to show off to tourists. The eagle hunting, the horseback culture, the horseback archery, and these old things that they used to do, they're still really uh, alive and well here in Kyrgyzstan. Moving on to a little bit more present history, you get the Soviet Union presence in the Russian Empire that really has shaped whatever kind of you think about modern Kyrgyzstan today. A lot of the culture is Russian, in the capital city here in Bishkek, the first language really is Russian. When you go outside of the city, they speak a lot more Kyrgyz, but you can't really enjoy or understand your experience here unless you understand a little bit about the Soviet Union times and about the Russian Empire. After the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, all of these countries, whether it was any of the countries in the Stan region or in the Caucasus, a lot of the industry, a lot of the financial connections, and a lot of the things that made these places rich and gave people jobs disappeared overnight. So Kyrgyzstan became a place where there was a lot of mining and a lot of industrial processing for the Soviet Union to a place where people were struggling to find work and it left a power vacuum where they were kind of unsure who was gonna rule the country or how the country would be stable after, uh, of course, the fall of uh, such a long-lasting empire for such a long time. If you look at the busy streets or the central part of Bishkek, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a lot of newer buildings. You're gonna see a lot of unfinished older buildings that didn't work because of financial reasons or embezzlement or some sort of corruption. 
And then you're gonna see a lot of Soviet style buildings, such as this, or such as the Philharmonic building. It's really a mix of old and new, a mix of communist and capitalist, a mix of uh, functioning and non-functioning governments. And I think that's what makes Kyrgyzstan so special. I'm not gonna comment so much on current day politics because I'm certainly not an expert, but apparently their current president was once in jail for corruption, but he's back. And the current party is pushing for a lot more Kyrgyz nationalism, just, uh, just as the Kazakhs are currently doing, the Uzbeks are currently doing, which is hard for a region that is so diverse and with borders that are so poorly drawn um, I'll discuss that in a second. An interesting thing that's happening in Central Asia since the fall of the Soviet Union is that these countries are trying to nationalize their identity and de-Russify themselves. I think is the best way to put it. So uh, you can see what's happening in Kazakhstan and what's happening in Uzbekistan. Russian, which was used for a long time and a lot of people still, of course, speak Russian, the majority do, uh, is falling out of favor. Uh, they've taken their national languages, whether it was Uzbek, Kazakh, and they've turned it into Latin letters to kind of move away from the, uh, from the Russians, as well as uh, established schools where they speak only Kazakh, where they speak only Uzbek, and that's happening here too in Kyrgyzstan, where uh, the educational language, of course, was Russian for a really long time. The consequences of this are, it kind of, there are still a lot of Russians living in the region, and it kind of leaves this kind of window as to who is going to be the friends of the Central Asians. Is it going to be China? Is it going to be India, Pakistan? Is it going to be Russia? Is it going to be the West? Is it going to be Turkey? Um, it kind of leaves this kind of door open for uh, a larger nation to kind of say, we're going to take care of these people. Turkey would be the obvious answer. And you see a lot of Turkish, uh, basically Muslim funded projects, whether it's building their large central mosque that they have here in Bishkek or funding other educational initiatives. So we'll see what happens in Kyrgyzstan. I'm not exactly sure what, what will happen or what it will look like in 20 years. What I do know about modern Kyrgyzstan is that once you get out of the capital city, Bishkek, it is a really, really poor country. It's one of the dustiest, poorest countries I've been to in quite a while. Poor not in like a, a sad way or in some sort of negative sense. Just there's not a lot of opportunities for the people here. They don't earn a lot of money. And a lot of the small towns well, quite quaint and quite beautiful, like Catabalta. Here's the link if you want to check out that video. They're really using resources that are quite old. I mean, even here you can see they're still using this Soviet-style bus from like literally 1978. This, of course, means that Kyrgyz people, especially the young ones, need to learn English or need to learn Russian and study abroad if they want to find money outside of Kyrgyzstan. So you find a lot of students going to the United States, you find a lot of students going to Russia, especially Moscow, and Kyrgyz people in general for work, whether they're highly educated or not. And now uh, a lot of Kyrgyz moving to Turkey, especially to Istanbul. I've met many people here who said they've lived in Istanbul. And since Kyrgyz is a Turkic language, they can pick up Turkish quite quickly. So the Turkish has, have a big presence here. There's a lot of actually Turkish higher education facilities here. And so there's this big connection that's being established. So I assume this Central Asian region will really become partners of Turkey more so than Russia in the future. Here's another example of the absolute mix that they have going on here. So they have this kind of, I actually think it's Russian script, but it's in a, it's in a style that looks quite Arabic. Here you have a horse lord or an academic, very uh, Middle Eastern kind of Central Asian style. And then of course you have this very Soviet building. It's, uh, it's great. So that being said, one thing that worries me about this region is that the borders have been really poorly drawn and there's a lot of ethnic divisions that are uh, incredibly tumultuous. So what does that mean? That means that uh, basically when these lines were drawn and when they incorporated this region into the Soviet Union, uh, what Stalin did a lot of times was make very precarious lines that left Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyz people in Tajikistan, Tajiks in Uzbekistan, and there's a bunch of enclaves, which you can see in the map here, which creates a lot of ethnic tension. Um, unfortunately, these maps have not been corrected, and so there's a lot of issue over, especially the Fergana Valley, which is this most densely populated area in Central Asia. You find ethnic tension between the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, and the Kyrgyz all living in that region, all because they're on kind of the wrong sides of the borders, or they're on the right side of the borders, they think their land is, they think they have claim to certain land. 
the Tajas think they've claimed a certain land. And so this kind of all erupted actually during my stay here a couple, a couple weeks ago, um, there was kind of a skirmish between the, uh, the Tajiks. They were hurling rocks at, uh, Kyrgyz police basically. And then the Kyrgyz fired on, on some villagers, which, uh, sparked a little bit of like border conflict, a little border skirmish, which, uh, is not uncommon here, but normally it's not violent. And it's something like 50 people died in that, in that skirmish, which is, which is not good. The thing is that while these ethnic conflicts are not unheard of, it's just that if all of these countries are being very pro-nationalist, they're probably going to be more and more common, which is not good for the Central Asian region because it's so messy already because you have so many people living across the border. Like for example, the largest, one of the larger cities in Uzbekistan, Samarkand, is actually a more ethnically Tajik city. Um, it's, it's a very confusing situation here. And uh, if you wanna learn more, I will put some links. So to finish our video as always, is it safe? I think Kyrgyzstan's incredibly safe. The people here are very warm, very friendly. Everyone's, not a lot of people speak English, but that's all right. Everyone's here to help. I find uh, everyone has been very welcoming and uh, I will definitely return. I really, really like this country. And is it cheap? It is a very poor country, so everything here is incredibly cheap. You can take a taxi for literally $1 all over Bishkek. Uh, you can get a coffee for 50 cents. You can eat at a restaurant for less than $5. It's a really nice place to be. And uh, during the summer, it the weather is phenomenal. But during the winter, the weather is abysmal. So I would not recommend coming here during the winter at all. So from this very traditional little neighborhood I just popped into with an Ashkana Stolovaya, a cafeteria where you can eat food and a children's play place, I say Rahmat, Spasiba, and I hope you guys learned something new. Um, this is Kyrgyzstan. If you have the chance to come to Central Asia, you will not regret it. It is such a unique and diverse part of the world. And it's certainly one of the most underrated places that I have been probably anywhere. So if you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe. And I hope to see you on the next one. Bye, Sedanya.